All right, awesome. Good morning. All right, so I'm here with Wendy. Well, my name is Dr. Dunbar, so thank you everybody for showing up. Um, super excited that everybody's here. Um, so this is our space, right? This is our time, and I'm really pumped that Wendy's here with us. She is an incredible human being. I really enjoy getting to know her and just has an awesome story and has been doing gut health for many years, helping women, and is a functional nutritionist and believes in plants and the power of plants, which immediately was a quick bond between the two of us. Um, so thank you, Wendy, for taking the time. And if you could just, I'd love for you to share your story. Um, I know it, but I think others would, would find value in that. So if you don't mind just giving us a little bit about you and then we'll, we'll dive into the gut. Yeah, no, I would love to. So um, we were talking yesterday about kind of what aspects of gut health you wanted to talk about today. And you mentioned gut health and mental health and the connection there. And I got really excited because my story starts back when I was very young. On one side of my family, I have a, a good history of um, mental illness, honestly. Lots of unhealthy family situations, I should say, and what ensues because of that. And so I saw firsthand the effects of the effects that, um, well, just the effects of mental health challenges in a family. And I decided at a really young age that I didn't want that to be that my story or the story for my children one day. And so I can't even tell you why, but I, I, I mean, I can remember being like 14, 15 years old and thinking about vegetables and it wasn't the kind of house I grew up in, but somehow I latched onto this idea that if I could put enough good things in my body, that maybe I wouldn't have like these negative impacts that, that, that maybe were genetic, maybe not. I didn't know, but I just knew that I felt like I had to have some kind of power. So at a really young age, I remember when I got my first job, I went to the health food store in the neighboring town and I bought alfalfa sprouts. Nice. <laughs> it sounds really funny, but it just, I didn't grow up in like a really like granola, crunchy health-based family. And so it was empowering. Yeah. And at the same time, I can remember making a sandwich and putting these sprouts on it and being like, I am doing something amazing for myself, you know? So as I grew up and I had children, um, I have six children. Um, my oldest is a boy. My youngest is a boy and I have four daughters in the middle. And my youngest daughter, my fifth child, when she was born, she was a little sad. And that's kind of an understatement. And it was a parent at a really young age. And I thought, oh no, the shoe, you know, the other shoe dropped. This is yeah. it. All genetics just dripped into this one child and now what am I going to do? Well, I know what I'm not going to do. And so I kind of was like, so we upped the fish oil, we upped the veggies, we, we taught her to meditate and visualize, and we spent time outside and we turned the screens off and just tried all these things. And it was a really wonderful experience. I, I can tell more about that story some other time, but it really set the stage, um, everything that I've been doing my whole life to really see firsthand the impact that our gut health and our mental health have on each other. Um, fast forward, I'm skipping lots of pieces, but I'll fast forward. I chose to go into nutrition. I chose to go into health and wellness because it's like deep in my bones. I believe people need to know that they have a choice because if we listen to the loudest voices on the outside, which we're not going to get into the government, <laughs> but I've often said like, man, if the, if, if like the powers that be put as much energy into teaching prevention and wellness, we wouldn't have, you know, 75% of the problem we have, but I just, I feel like it's a privilege to be that voice, to be one of the voices in the world going, Hey, wait a second. I know you're hearing all these things, but you might not know this. And this yeah. is powerful. So I ended up getting a new a functional nutrition certification. I've studied essential oils and plant medicine for 12 years now. And I also became GI map certified a few years ago, which is reading the lab tests, the stool tests of people who were having lots of issues. And I've just learned a lot. And I just am, I mean, and I'm coming through COVID, I taught a whole COVID class and gut health and metabolic. I mean, it is amazing. I look at it and I think, wow, this is really this impacts everything. And I'm just excited to talk. About yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. All good stuff. So good. And you sort of mentioned this GI map and we'll get into that a little bit more. Cause I think that's, you know, a lot of people want data, right? They really like data. They want data. And the question is, do we need some of that data? You know, can we, can we sort of work empirically based on symptoms, you know, so we'll, we'll get into GI mapping, but maybe let's, let's go super basic first, right? Let's just talk, like, tell us about the gut. Like, what what's going i know right this is like I'm handing you your 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 this is your world right this is your jam so tell mm -hmm. me about the gut like just super basic 
what does it do? How does it get nutrients? You know, like all of that stuff, just okay. break it down for us. Okay. So I thought you'd ask <laughs> slides <laughs> because I'm a visual person. And I always think to myself, if I can explain this to my children, yeah. then that is going to be the most impactful for any adult too, because very few of us are trained in, you know, yeah. You know, okay, so let's see if I even talk about technology. Let's see if I know how to share my screen. That's the question. So I can see your screen. So you're good there. And here we go. Then I think we're going, okay, good. Okay, so let's go here and see if it's going to do what I want it to do. Okay, maybe, hold on. We got to start at the beginning here. There we go. <laughs> okay, there we go. Love okay, it. so um, I chose these pictures on front because on the left, obviously we have like all the good fruits and veggies and all those really great whole foods. And on the right is my favorite picture of like the bacteria in our gut. <laughs> so, nice. <clears throat> excuse me. So this, the little, uh, graphic here on the left is really fun and does a great job. So I want you to focus on this girl eating her piece of pizza. It looks like, <laughs> or something. And let's talk about when we talk about gut bacteria, you may have heard the term microbiome, or maybe you've actually heard the term gut bacteria, but they, they're one and the same. And off to the right, actually, there's like a little magnifying glass. It's just a collection of microorganisms that live in our digestive tract. And they play a crucial role, not just in digestion, which means like breaking our food down, but then the, uh, the reabsorption of those nutrients that go on to do like a thousand million amazing things in our body. So the first thing, I, uh, looking back at this girl, the function, so I guess to just kind of reiterate, the function of the digestive system and us eating is to get fuel into our body. The body's going to break it down and redistribute it the way that our body needs to use it. So if we look on the left here, she's, let's just pretend that we're taking this, we'll, we'll pretend she's eating veggie pizza with vegan cheese, just for, just for fun, just for funsies. <laughs> some, of her, some of you all are like, no, nope, that's not what we're eating. <laughs> But we're going to pretend she is. Anyway, so she takes a bite and she starts chewing. And immediately with the chewing action and smelling it, it's like, oh, that smells really good. I can smell that garlic and smell those onions. It activates enzyme production under your tongue. So digestion starts in the mouth. So imagine if that's like phase one of digestion and you're like in a car driving your kid across town and everybody's shoving down food really fast to make it to practice in time, we're missing a crucial step in digestion. And the reason that matters is because a lot of people that come to me and literally like 75% of the people in the world experience bloating or discomfort at one time or another in their, in their um, stomach area, or their gut region. And this right here is one of my favorite things to teach people is like literally chew your food and chew it to liquid. So let's pretend that she chews it to liquid. She swallows it and it's going to travel down the esophagus where it goes to the stomach. A fun fact about the stomach is that the stomach acid pH is 1.5. So when we think about a scale of pH, if you're not familiar with this, it's like acidity versus alkalinity. And um, when it comes to our stomach, that number, the lower the number, the higher the acidic rate. That is like, I mean, the acid in our stomach could like destroy a lot of things. It's like really acidic and we want it that way on purpose. So when your stomach acid is that, that number is real low. If you happen to eat a bad piece of something that's got bacteria in it, your stomach is like, don't worry about it. We got it. We prepared for this. But there are certain things that can happen, like if we eat a lot of processed food, um, we're going to talk about the gut lining in a second, it can compromise the gut lining in the stomach and by default compromise the acidity of the stomach. Suddenly you don't tolerate things very well. Oh man, I ate this and I'm not feeling too good. Or, you know, you're getting acid reflux. This all has to do with the acidity of the stomach and fun fact just because you're feeling that acidic reaction in your, when you might experience heartburn or acid reflux, it's not because you have too much stomach acid. It's actually because you have too little. And there's a whole different, there's a whole different thing going on. There's a flap on the bottom of the esophagus that is meant to stay closed. And when the balance is not correct in the stomach, it causes inflammation, that flap sort of hangs open. And that's why you get sort of that, that refluxy or acid reflux heartburn feeling. So it, it's, 
it, it's counterintuitive, but we want the stomach to be full of acid. Well, what happens? Stuff gets broken down. Our food gets broken down, broken down. Stomach does its job. And then it goes down here into the small intestine where it gets bro broken down even smaller, even smaller, even smaller. And then into the large intestine, we're breaking it down even smaller. And what's happening along the way is there is a gut lining. And I'm going to see if I, is it my next slide by chance? Oh, there we go. Well, no, it's not. I'm going to have to go back here. I want to show you the gut line. Oh, no. Hold on. Okay. I guess my gut lining didn't get in there. That's all right. Anyways, what happens is that if the gut lining gets compromised, then um, you get what's called leaky gut. You've heard this term. This is very popular. You want the tight, you want the tight junctions. I want you to think of like a fence and you don't want to see the neighbor next door. You do not want to see the neighbor next door. You don't want to see their lawn. You don't want to see their dogs. And so you build your fence with slats really close together. But what happens is if you don't take care of your fence and it warps, all of a sudden you get little gaps in it and you're like, man, they never clean their lawn. You know, it's the same kind of thing in your gut. You want the junctions. The lining of your stomach is like cilia sort of little, think of it like a fence. You want it tight. When I teach people, I'll say, think of it like, um, the knights surrounding a castle, protecting the castle. You want them standing very close together. You don't want any gaps in this because gaps means the enemy can get through. And so when you have a leaky gut and you're absorbing these nutrients, they should be absorbed through the cilia, which is tiny little openings um, on this mucosal lining of your whole intestinal tract. In a perfect world, you eat that food, it breaks down, it goes through these, like think of like a, um, I mean, think of this is going to sound really funny, but like the nipple of a bottle when you get that tiny little opening, that's the size of the opening. These nutrients are meant to reabsorb back into your bloodstream to be taken to your brain and, and all the organs of your body to do all the good things. But if the tight junctions are open a little bit, they actually, um, or excuse me, they're supposed to go into your cells. But if the tight junctions are open a little bit, they go back into your bloodstream. And that's what we don't want because this causes inflammation and joint pain and autoimmune disease and all sorts of stuff. So that's kind of like a basic overview. Whoops, I already did that. Um, so uh, is there anything else you want me to say about that? Because I was going to jump into the gut brain, but we can talk a little bit more about the gut itself. No, I think that's great. And I love the analogy about the fence because I've often tried to explain like leaky gut to people. And it's so hard to find something that's that's easy for people to understand. So I love that fence analogy, right? You want it super tight. You don't want to see your neighbor. You want to control where that absorption is happening. You don't want things coming across that fence lining. So I, I think that was, that was awesome. And I think that's a great explanation. So I think that feeds to, okay, now we understand how important the gut is. Well, how does that affect brain and mood disorder and, you know, depression and anxiety and all, and all of those things. So, yeah, no, I think that was perfect. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Oh, and I just, you said mood anxiety and I was just like, oh, so here's the thing. The truth is, is that I'm a big truth girl. And sometimes the truth is not fun. Like there's like, you know, there's like that saying, like the truth will set you free. It might break your heart first and make you sad, but ultimately it will set you free. And the truth is, is that what we eat really does matter. And there's a movement going on right now um, about I mean, I'm sorry if this triggers anybody like intuitive eating and body positive and, and I am so supportive of like the meaning behind these movements and I'm aware of disordered eating and we're just, it's just rampant in our culture. And I think ultimately where the two can come together, if there's anybody listening to this, who, who's feeling like, wait, but you know, what I'm about to say matters because we can't, like, if you mix ammonia and bleach, you're going to get something toxic that will kill you. You could say that you love the smell of ammonia and you think they clean really well together all day long. And I've found this magic combination that gets the moldu or the mildew off my shower. And it's going to be very toxic and probably kill you. So like, that's the truth. So it doesn't matter what we want to be true. The truth is those two are toxic. And so what we eat really does matter. I, I mean, I am blown away by literal mental health professionals that I've talked to over the years that say, show me the research. There's no connection between sugar and depression. There's no, um, there's no connection between diet and anxiety. I just, I'm just like blown away. <laughs> so 
here's the deal. It matters what you eat. And so the question I would ask yourself, if you're listening to this and you're concerned, or you've got, you're thinking, gosh, could there possibly be this connection? Is this something I should look into? The question I would have you ask yourself is like, what have you been doing? How have you been living your life? And what have your results been? And are you ready and willing for something new and different? Because if you are, you're going to have to take a different road. You're going to have to have a different mindset. Things are going to have to be different if you want to feel different than you have. So with that said, let's talk about the gut brain connection. So back in the last slide, we were talking about how we eat these foods and they become nutrients for our, um, for our body. I actually, I'm going to go to this next slide and come back to the other one. So this slide shows just, it's just like a, just, just sort of a fun little showing of the different types of bacteria we have in our gut. We actually have more bacteria in our gut than we have DNA in our body. So let that sink in for a second. When sometimes we think, oh, well, I'm quote, genetically disposed to this, or I'm genetically disposed to that. Yes, our genetics are important, but our gut bacteria, our microbiome has a far greater reach and a far greater influence on our overall health than our genetics. Like that's the truth. So this is just an example of lots of different um, bacteria. We have, we have beneficial bacteria in our gut and we have bacteria that, that is like um, beneficial in different ways. Let me explain. Your gut is not like good guys and bad guys. I, I teach it like that, but I don't want you to think of it like that. I want you to think of it like, um, like, do you ever in the summertime, the mosquitoes come out and you're like, why do you exist? Why? 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 Well, they do exist for a reason because they are the predator for something else. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure it's, you know, <laughs> keeps the world in check. That's kind of how our gut is. Like there's bacteria that we want more of and there's bacteria that we want less of. So we're not trying to eradicate all of the candida albicans. We're not trying to, to um, eradicate all the clostridium, which fun fact, clostridium, when, they, it, when it's in an overgrowth um, pattern, it is always correlated with anxiety. How interesting is that? Staphylococcus aureus, like that's like staph and strep infections. Nobody really wants those, but you don't want them completely eradicated from your gut because they serve a purpose to kind of keep other guys like, like, like you need a little bit of gang culture in your gut. You know, I love that gang culture. <laughs> I love it. Somebody keeping track, like yeah. the neighborhoods in check. You know what I'm saying? So anyways, so let's go to the next slide here. Um, Okay, wait. can I jump in one second, Wendy? Because you said something, and I just want to chime in just from even beyond gut health. Because you mentioned that, you know, yes, there may be some genetic sort of predisposition, you know, for let's say, you know, you've had, you know, mental health disorders in your family, and maybe there's some genetic component. But what we eat and how we live our life, and right now we're just talking nutrition, and both Wendy and I are on the same page as far as. There's non-nutritional, right? Non-food things that we can do to sort of maximize our health and really create an environment that promotes health and wellness and vitality. And it's those things, 80 to 90% of it, that correlates with disease or health as opposed to genetics, right? So 80% is likely more lifestyle, food included. And there's probably like 10, 20% that's genetic. And we can actually turn on and off our sort of genes and our, and our risk for certain diseases based on how we live our lifestyle, nutrition being part of it. So even beyond, you know, just anxiety and depression and mood disorder, we're talking like cancers, we're talking type two diabetes, right? We're talking, you know, all these things that we, that we see are, are causing so much um, sickness and, and disease in our population that if we change our lifestyle food included, um, we would, we would have our quality of life just, just exponentially improved. So I just wanted to throw that in there. The term is called epigenetics, right? That term is lifestyle really defines our quality of life, not your DNA. Yeah. So I heard somebody refer to that epigenetics as genetics load the gun and lifestyle pulls the trigger. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Love that. I love epigenetics. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's huge. So to your point, when you started saying, you know, we have, we have more control over our health and that, that for sure was sort of my reason for sort of stepping outside of traditional healthcare. 
is to arm people with the education, the, the knowledge, and then the support, because some of this may not be easy, right? Like you said, it, the truth, it, sometimes it's, it, it's hard to hear the truth. And then when you're ready to make that change, supporting people in that change can be challenging. But yeah, if people are ready, your quality of life and the way you go through life can be dramatically different if, if you're armed with the right information. So I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to, to tag team that epigenetics concept. I'm so glad you did. And I'm glad you threw in there how you stepped away from traditional medicine, which, you know, when we talked on the phone, I just heard your story, which I'm sure I don't even know a portion of it. I want to know the rest of it, but like, whoa, you, the women in your community are so lucky to have a doctor, like a medical doctor. Who's like, okay, I went to school. I know how to like help sick people, but I can't sleep at night not continuing to tell people that there's a way to prevent the stuff that you, that all the people came to my office for, for all those. I mean, it, the courage, I just, I just love you for that. And I'm so excited. I, I had no idea lifestyle medicine existed for a doctor. It's like, yes. Yeah. So, so yeah. yeah. We had, we had quite the conversation. We have so much more to learn about each other. So it's going to be fun, but yeah, I just, I feel blessed, right? I feel blessed to have discovered it. I feel blessed to be able to share and create partnerships and relationships with like-minded people to just, to really just help people have a good quality of life. That's my goal, right? I mean, it's just, I want people to live life to the fullest, um, whatever that looks like. Yeah. So. Well, that's, I like, I actually really like that you bring that up because at the end of the day, you know, it's like, um, I, I heard a quote once that the, the ultimate, let's see, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. To find climbed the corporate ladder only to learn that you were, that your ladder was parked on the wrong tree, you know? And I feel like, I feel like, you know, that is like, what is, what is the purpose? What, what do we want for, for people? Like people want to be happy. They want to enjoy the relationships in their lives. They want to be able to, you know, in my, in my personal training over the years, I remember the first time I went to a pelvic floor specialist after I'd had my last baby. And we were doing like physical training. And she said, what's the purpose of your training, Wendy? And I was doing all these workouts, you know, and I was yeah. like, uh, I don't know. And she's like, I want you to go home and think about it and come back and tell me next time. And I went home and I thought about it. I thought, okay, what's the purpose of why I take care of my body? And I really came up with a few specific things. It was like, I love hiking with my family. I mm -hmm. want to be able to play catch. I want to chase my kids around and play tag. I like to roller skate, you know, like I came up with like, these are the things that give me joy in life. And so I feel like with our health, you bring up a really great point. It's that same thing. Like you're, you stepped back from traditional medicine because you're like, I just want people to enjoy their lives. And so I think for anybody watching, it's such a good question. It's like, what's the purpose of me wanting to feel better? Why do I want to feel good? Why do I want to thrive? Why do I want to have more energy or, you know, a better mental health situation. Cause that's really going to fuel, you know, going to give us, give us the gas to get through all yeah. the hard parts. <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. Yes, okay. yes, yes. So I, I interrupted you. Keep no, going. Keep going. I'm sure it'll happen again with me too. Okay. So back to like, why, how does gut health affect mental health? So I want you to think for a second, I'm really big on analogies. There are um, neuro pathways in our body. So, or, or there's neuro pathways in our brain and, but let's take a step back even further. We are just a giant conglomeration of cells, our body. We are just cells. That's what we are. We are all kinds of cells. I have a slide, but I didn't, I didn't put it in here. We just have a, like tons of different kinds of cells in our body. And we basically are this giant mass of cells that are talking to each other all the time. And that cell communication is super important. And so you, that's why I have the picture of the highway. Just think of like a super highway of communication in our body. And neurotransmitters are like the air traffic controllers. And they sort of like, they sort of like tell the ce certain cells what to do. Okay. So these are different types of neurotransmitters. Um, let me move this guy so I can... You've probably heard of some of them. We know about serotonin and dopamine. Those are mood transmitters. Um, nor, uh, noradrenaline, noradrenaline is a concentration neurotransmitter. Adrenaline, fight or flight. I'm sure lots of us are familiar with that one. Mm -hmm. GABA, calming. Acetylcholine is more for learning, glutamate memory, endorphins, euphoria. You know, if you've ever like got, had a great workout and you're like, 
crazy. Yeah. It's like those endorphins, you know? So these neurotransmitters are incredibly important. But the question is, um, oh, I love this little slide, serotonin and dopamine. Technically the only two things you enjoy. <laughs> But the, the reason our gut health has an impact on our brain health, actually, I'm going to go back to that first slide. I don't think I ordered these quite as, um, or uh, this guy right here. So the reason that these guys have such an impact, let me pull them up there together, is that the gut and the brain are always talking together. It's called the gut brain axis. And so there's a communication that goes, that goes back and forth. Did you know that I think it's 80 it's 80 or 90%. It's a huge percentage of our serotonin is made in our gut. It's produced in our gut. Our intestines look very similar. If you look at the brain and you look at the intestines, this is very similar tissue and matter because it's made up of very similar things. And so when you have, when you have a gut that is talking to a brain, if that gut is messed up, if it's inflamed, if it's, if it's experiencing, you know, like oxidative stress, if it's, um, if it's not, if it's not having like a quality situation going on, then it's not sending quality information to the brain. That's like the most simple way that I can kind of explain it. So let's back up again. When we were talking about food. There are, like we said, beneficial bacteria in our gut and, and there's bacteria that needs to be there, but we want them, we want less of them. So there's more beneficial and less beneficial. So if you, um, there's an old like Native American proverb that says, uh, so there's two wolves that live inside of us at all times. And one is selfish and angry and resentful. And the other is full of compassion and generosity. And um, they're always fighting. And the little grandson says, well, which one wins grandpa? And he says, whichever one you feed. And hmm. so really similar to our gut. So if we want to promote more of the good bacteria in our gut, then we need to feed that bacteria its preferred food. And so I love that Dr. Dunbar was talking about plants. Plants, whole foods have two things. Well, they have lots of things going for them, but as far as the gut, they've got a couple of things going for them. One is prebiotic foods pre uh, and, and the other is probiotic foods. So when we say probiotics, we'll call those like the kind of bacteria that we want more of pro we are pro good biotics. Right. And so with, for those guys, um, they eat prebiotics. So the food for probiotic or good bacteria is prebiotic bacteria and prebiotic bacteria comes from things like onions and leeks. And I mean, it, we don't need to get too specific, but it comes from whole foods. And so um, by, by eating foods that have like uh, insoluble fiber, it sits in the gut. And it's like, <laughs> so funny, like when you have a hamster and you feed them food and they just sit in that bowl and they come to it, it's kind of like your hamster feeding the bacteria in your gut because that there's digestible soluble ba uh, bacteria and there's insoluble bacteria. The insoluble bacteria sits there and becomes the food for probiotic bacteria. So <laughs> hopefully that like makes sense. So the more good foods that we put in, we're strengthening, we are strengthening that good bacteria. Now that's to strengthen the guys that are already there. But what if you've, for example, ever had an antibiotic in your life? Um, I mentioned that I do GI mapping. I had a woman come to me who had like a lot of digestive issues. They've been going on for years. She'd done all the traditional routes. We ran ahead and ran a GI map, a stool a sample that gives like a broad spectrum, actually a very detailed look at all the bacteria in her gut. So she had one specific issue that we were working on. Three months later, we were doing the end of her treatment and we do a follow-up GI map. And she had a specific problem that had nothing to do with the good bacteria in her body. But on her follow-up map, she had no beneficial bacteria on her GI map, none. And I remember reading it before our, before our call. And I thought, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, wait a second. Did I do something wrong? You know, we're using all these herbs and natural things and, and I'm racking my brain for what was on her, <laughs> excuse me, on her protocol. We get on the phone and I, and I ask her how she's feeling. She said, I was feeling really good, but man, a couple of weeks ago, I thought I had a yeast infection. So I asked my doctor for an antibiotic. Oh. And it, and it had literally wiped, wiped it out. I mean, I, it was mind blowing to see it. It was gone, nothing. And I was just like, if you have no beneficial bacteria in your gut, 
you are at risk for like clostridia, which I showed you on the slide before, for an overgrowth of clostridia and an overgrowth of escherichia. Like you, you overgrow certain types of types of bacteria and you will have anxiety. Yeah. You will feel depressed, like a hundred percent. So anyways, what do you do if you're like, oh, I've had, and, and, I, and you guys, they're listening. This doesn't matter if you had antibiotic once when you were five. If you have never done anything to replenish that bacteria in your gut, it didn't get replenished. Yeah. And if your kid had, you know, an ear infection when they were little and one round of antibiotics and you're like, I just can't figure out why they have a cold all the time and they're 15, you know, that's why. That's one of the reasons why yeah. <laughs> but yeah. that's, that's a, that plays a role. So anyways, so how do you, how do you actually get more good bacteria in your gut? This is where fermented foods come in. Yeah. If you've heard anything or been in the circuit, we talk about raw sauerkraut, kimchi, kefir for some people, if they want like any kind of fermented food, even, even um, really good fermented sourdough bread has some benefits, you know, although it's not my preferred source, like raw sauerkraut is my number one recommendation because the benefits of eating two tablespoons of raw sauerkraut a day are unmatched. And I have, and I have given people prescriptions for large doses of probiotic. And sometimes that's necessary if they're doing something intense in their gut, but the benefits of eating raw sauerkraut, two tablespoons a day are unmatched. And when you combine that with like a whole food um, prebiotic base that now is feeding the new bacteria that you're putting in there, you suddenly can literally, like, like Dr. Dunbar was saying, you can change the expression of all of your genes because now the messages coming from the gut to the brain are clean and they're clear. They're not muddled. You know, it's like, I mean, during COVID, one of my favorite experiences was like, we're all wearing masks and there's two plexiglass plastic things in between me and the girl at Subway. And she's like, what did you want on your sandwich? And she can't hear me. And I can't hear her. And I'm like, this is big plexiglass in the box. That's what happens to your neurotransmit, like that communication when yeah. we feed ourselves processed food, which I mean, listen, I love me a good white trash. I shouldn't say that term. I'm sorry, but you know, like a, like a Swiss cake roll or, you know, like garbage food that we used to eat when we were like, <laughs> so excited we're a little like I there's a part of me that loves that stuff you know there really is but that will coat your cells and yeah. inhibit their ability to communicate so you know I'm not one that's going to say like all or nothing but I'm going to tell you make 90% of your choices solid good clean choices that improve the communication of your cells and I'll be honest my motivation for eating well is far more influenced by my mental health and the mental health of my family than are than like wanting to look a certain way. Although I'm not gonna lie, we all like to look good, but you know what I'm saying? Like the mental health aspect has a far greater impact and influence on my life, my relationships, my work, my mindset, the way I feel about myself, the way I see others. So, anyways. <laughs> yeah. And I think you bring bring up a good point. You know, again, when we start thinking about okay, like you said, what's your purpose? Um, you know, why you know, why did you decide to listen to this? Or why are you curious about, gosh, is there more I could do? What's that purpose? And then once you sort of find that purpose that I think aligns with your values, that's the other thing, right? Like really think about what, what's attached to your values and who, who do you want to be? What's that kind of person you want to be and present to the world and to your family? And once you have a clear sense of that, the other thing that I find is, is sometimes people feel like they have to give up everything right? And that's not necessarily the case. Whatever motion you're willing to make in that direction is going to confer some benefit. So like Wendy was saying, even if it's 70, 80, 90% of what you eat is that whole food, plant strong, prebiotic, probiotic, and you're really juicing up your beneficial bacteria, that's much better than doing nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So don't feel like you have to be perfect. What is it? What is it? Perfection is the enemy of good or something like that, right? Don't, you don't have to be perfect here. It's whatever motion you're willing to make is going to, is going to confer some benefit um, when it comes to your gut and when it comes to reducing your risk of disease, when it comes to your, your mood and your mental health. So um, start where you are, 
and just add as your body gives you feedback, right? Because I'm, I guarantee it. I, I enjoy nothing more than just try it, just try it and see how you feel. And people come back and they're like, holy moly, I had no idea. And I'm like, yes, that's the juice. That's the juice. Go for that. Yeah. I mean, it, it will, your body gives you feedback. It feels good to sort of take care of yourself. Um, so yeah, I get all pumped. I could go on and on and on. So I just want to throw that you bring up like what will you do you know um back to the gi mapping i was telling dr dunbar that i i did gi mapping took clients for a solid year and at the end of the year i pulled back because it was it was it was a lot it was asking a lot of people a huge amount of dietary restrictions with the protocols that we were issuing a huge amount of supplementation i mean nearly a hundred pills a day for some people i mean it's just giant amounts. And I started to feel like, wait a second. And compliance was like at like maybe 30% of my clients and because it was just too much. And so I love that you bring that up. You know, you're never a prophet in your own land. And my mom, my mom, sometimes I'm just like, mom, I'm trying to tell you these things, you know, anyways, recently she went to the doctor and they told her she had a handful of things going on and they recommended this thing and that thing. And she came home and she said, I just don't know if I want to do this. And I said, well, mom, what are, what are the things that are bothering you the, the most? And she said, well, I think I have to, like, she clears her throat a lot. She goes, they, they said that it's probably like an acid reflux thing, even though I don't feel it it's like associated and some tests showed it or whatever. And I said, well, is it something you want to work on? And she said, well, I mean, I guess it would be nice to not be clearing my throat all the time. And so I asked her mom, how much water are you drinking a day? Well, she wasn't, <laughs> you know? And so I was like, well, let's start there. Like, are you willing to just drink some more water? And she was. And then after that, she was willing to add two tablespoons of sauerkraut a day. And she has stuck with that for three months. That's huge. Like these, those are those two habits alone. So I love it. She said, it's like, what are you willing to do? Let's not get the cart before the horse. Yeah. Too many habits, tr you know, trying to implement too many habits in the beginning that don't, that aren't real true habits yet will really end up being discouraging in the end. So I, I love that. Yeah. I do have, I do have two, I do have two things I'd like to share though, if that's okay. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I feel like are, if you're willing, if you're listening to this and you're like, okay, I might be game for like one or two habit changes. I'm going to offer you, there are some things that are worth their weight in gold. Like, like, here's the thing, drinking water. So important. Like we're on the same page on all that kind of stuff. These are like two secrets that are worth their weight in absolute gold. And they are probably two things that I would assume most people are not eating. These are two foods that you're probably not eating. And if you found a way to sneak these or just flat out plop them into your diet once a day, I think you would see dramatic differences in your health over time. And the first is greens, leafy green vegetables. And so this is really interesting. Leafy green vegetables. I just was reading an article yesterday about this in the um, NCIH. Is that what it is? <laughs> it's like, like, a, like, a, like a legit article yeah. about the tight junctions that we were talking about in the, um, in the gut. We want that. We want that gut lining very tight together. If your gut lining is real tight, your immunity is high. Um, you feel good. Like there's so like, that's an indicator that that real good gut lining is an indicator and eating green leafy vegetables, um, turns on a gene in your gut that signals the production of tighter junctions. So that's amazing. But on top of that, it's high in chlorophyll and magnesium and is so good for your mental health. Greens yes. are so good for your mental health. Now, the other superpower that is not sexy at all is beans. <laughs> and I know, you know, there's all the jokes about beans, find a bean like, but here's a, especially for women, if you will eat beans for breakfast, I know it sounds crazy, but it's only here in the West that we think we have to have like a sweet, you know, traditional breakfasty thing, but they are, they do a couple things. They do a lot of things, but beans are great at regulating your blood glucose levels. So many times the reasons that we feel anxious or depressed or whatever is because of the fluctuations in blood glucose, because it's a direct result from our diet. 
-hmm. If we eat things that digest fast, our body's like, okay, digest, digest, and then it drops, you know? But yeah. if we eat things that digest slow, the body has a chance to kind of like acclimate and it's like more, ch it's like chill. And not to mention the type of fiber that is in beans is so it's like it's like on par with sauerkraut like you want you want these people in your gut you want them there and you want them there every day and they also have a type of fiber in them that binds to your that, that binds to sort of if you've ever heard the term xenoestrogens there's like these there's like there's like um one of the reasons we don't want people drinking out of plastic or eating processed food is there's xenoestrogens they're fake estrogens that are found in, in fake things, basically. And the way you can think about it is like, again, our cells are always communicating with each other and um, eating things that are high in phytoestrogens or not even high, but have them present. Those are plant-based estrogens. This is a positive thing. Don't get freaked out like, oh no, this is gonna mess up my heart. No, that's not what we're talking. We're talking nature. And there are phytoestrogenic properties in beans. And so when you eat them first thing in the morning, Basically, you can think of estrogens or xenoestrogens, the fake ones, as being like that loud girl at the party. And you're just like, oh my gosh, please keep your voice down. She comes in and she just like takes over. That's what xenoestrogens do. And they, <laughs> they plant themselves on the receptor sites and they're like, bam, estrogens here, but it's not cool. And so what you want to do is you eat those phytoestrogens first thing and they plant themselves on those cell receptor sites and they're like estrogens here and it's a much calmer experience so especially huh. this is like a community of women if you are willing to take like the super challenge implement some beans and greens and um that would be a fantastic way two fantastic ads you know along with maybe water or whatever, but just real, those are some superpower things that I just have to share because I love yeah, them. I love it. I'm, I'm like jonesing again because I'm, you know, 51 this year. I'll be 51 later this month. Um, so I'm for sure perimenopausal, um, sneaking into that, you know, next stage. And so all the things that come with, you know, the change in our estrogen and progesterone levels are happening, right? Body composition starts to change. You just don't have that like you used to. Um, so all of those things are happening. So we'll have to, you, you piqued my interest with that, with that beads. Cause I, I mean, I have beans in my, my normal nutrition, but from, from a menopause standpoint and symptom management, that's an interesting concept. So I've already got a topic for, for our next talk, Wendy. We're going to be spending a lot of time together. We're going to come back and, and circle and talk about menopause, right? I mean, because I think there's, we don't talk enough about menopause. Women in general are just under-researched, um, mm -hmm. under-cared for. We don't talk about our period. We don't talk about menopause. It's like, oh gosh, I don't know what to do with that. It just sort of freaks people out. And we're just sort of left out here to, to figure out how to live in you know, through sort of these, these hormonal changes, but still be really vital, really active, really, you know, sort of healthy, um, in spite of the hormonal changes, which are totally normal and totally natural. So we need to take care of ourselves and we need the information and the knowledge to be able to continue to live really vital and healthy lives. So topic number two, but let's, let's finish GI. Yeah. Okay. So I think, um, let's see here. Yeah. Can we talk? I don't know how we are on time, but can we, what are your thoughts? Um, because I want you to show GI map too, because I think that's a value for people. So, but I don't want to rush you. If you think you want to, there's a little bit more with the gut brain, we can certainly do that, but just if we can save time to just show what GI map looks like and, um, you know, again, you know, how you use it and, and what you've learned over time with it. Yes. Yeah, so let me pull this. Yeah. I did I stop my share really quick? I, I feel good yeah. about I feel like we covered a really good amount of um, okay. the basics. I feel great about that. Let me, let me pull up this GI map. I love that. Beans and greens. Love beans it. Beans and greens. Okay. You could do like a tofu scramble with some spinach and beans in it in the morning. Yes. That sounds amazing. Oh, uh, sorry. I don't. Oh, there we go. Okay. See what this is. Clicky, clicky. There we go. Okay. Now we'll start and share again. Okay. 
Okay, so let me get this. There we go. Get all the way up. Okay, so this is what a GI map looks like. Can you see this bar that I'm dragging around? I don't know yeah. what to. I don't know I what to see do. Your with that. cursor moving around. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you don't see a big black bar. No. Okay, good. There's some big black bar here. Okay, so here's an example of a GI map. So basically, like I said, it's a stool sample, and it's going to show us a handful of different. Oh wait, hold on a second. Is oh there we go. I was like, wait, where's page two? Okay, so it's going to show us um, bacterial pathogens. So this is these are actually things that we don't want, like things like Salmonella, um, things like uh, E. coli, C. diff, things like that. And if it shows lower DL, this just means um, no detected levels. And normal, again, we were talking about the fact that we're not looking to necessarily eradicate, you know, sometimes that's not possible. And it's like a symphony, you know, so these are the normal levels under, and the E to the three is parts per, um, oh gosh, it's like parts per million. It's a very, it's a very close look. So it tests for parasites and viruses, the norovirus, adenovirus. Let's go to page two. This is kind of the, the bad guys. Um, let's see if you can, okay. It also tests for H. pylori, which honestly, I think it's estimated that easily over 50% of population of the entire world has H. pylori. And so H. pylori is found in like um, contaminated drinking water. So it's especially high, especially in third world countries. But again, normal is a range. It's not completely eradicated. So in this person right here, oh, and then we have the normal bacterial flora. This is what we would call the beneficial bacteria. So the uh, Bacteroidetes fragilis, um, Bifidobacterium enterococcus, Clostridia we talked about right here, Enterobacter, Acromantia. Um, interesting, um, when somebody has no detected levels of Acromantia, the, this is actually the range, these are the ranges that we want. So this person has no Acromantia that's detected, but we actually want some. And one of the things that we notice across the board in people that don't have Acromantia, my first GI map I ran on myself, I had zero Acromantia. And um, I, we could talk for a long time and I'll try and keep it really short, but people who have no acromancia have trouble maintaining a healthy weight and they usually have metabolic disorders. So, um, which could be hormone driven. It could come for a, lots of different reasons. 80% of all Americans are metabolically unsound. That is fact across the board. And when we say metabolically unsound, I mean, glucose spikes, insulin levels, like it's all what, what Dr. Dunbar was saying. It's all within our capacity to control. So this is a really interesting thing to see somebody that has no acromancia. Do you know how to pr promote more acromancia? In, in like a GI map protocol, we prescribe, or we, um, it's not prescriptions, it's, it's natural stuff that we recommend a supplement that is um, a pomegranate powder. It's very high in antioxidants. What else is very high in antioxidants? <laughs> fruits and vegetables. <laughs> exactly. All your berries and all that stuff, right? Yeah. And so this is, this is really interesting. Um, so anyways, the phylomicrobiota right here, the bacteroidetes, formicutes, and the, and this is the ratio. This gives us a look of like, okay, this is the ratio of these two different types of good bacteria. And this is like, this is kind of the ratio we want them to be in. Okay. That's great. Okay. Over here, what we look for is opportunistic bacteria. So these are guys that when they get too overgrown, they cause problems. So right here, you rec you'll you recognize like streptococcus. That's like a really, that's one that we love to like get the cleaners out and make sure that the hospital's clear. So we don't pass on, you know, like um, some of those really high grade cleaners will say kills streptococcus, staphylococcus, excuse me, because these are, these, these guys, you know, overgrown, you don't want them. Um, Bacillus, you'll notice right here, um, lactobacillus, does that sound familiar? That's in a lot of probiotics. Bacillus is actually an opportunistic. And so you can, oh, you can get too much of like a, of a, like a probiotic that you take by your, in your mouth, like you could get too much of it. And so, um, and, and when you do, it causes constipation, which is really interesting, but, interesting. Uh, yeah. So if you, if you have too much bacillus, you actually will struggle with constipation. 
And then you get down here, um, there's one, oh, right here, the methobacteria. When this guy's overgrown, you're very gassy. Very, you're just like, I am just like a gas station. And so usually you'll find that when this is overgrown. And then these are really interesting. These are potential autoimmune triggers. And you don't, you know, again, you're, there's a normal, there's a normal range, but you kind of want these to stay undetected because when these particular bacteria get overgrown, they don't, it doesn't say you have an autoimmune disease. That's not what I'm saying, but kind of what it does. It's like, it's loading the gun, but your lifestyle gets to pull the trigger. So this is interesting. This person has protovella and fusobacterium, but um, it's interesting, the lab that um, we do these labs from, they said, everybody's kind of showing up with these right now, like for years, like the last five or 10 years. So it's not something to be alarmed about. But if this was really high, Protovella and um, uh, Club, Club Ciala right here, those, when they're really high, they can indicate um, like rheumatoid arthritis on the horizon kind of a thing. So it's really interesting. Right down here is uh, fungus and yeast. We know that we don't want candida. We know that. Candida albicans, ooh, you do not want that. You don't want that because it causes all kinds of problems. And this person happens to have candida. Can also look for Epstein-Barr and the cytomegalovirus. So it's, it's really detailed. Now, the reason I share this is that this GI map, um, I work with a doctor who, orders the, who ordered, the, um, ordered the tests and making no money at all, it's $279 for this test. So um, most doctors will not do that and they make us turn a little profit and it's like 350 for the test. Most of these lab tests are like always $300. The protocol for this person um, and most people involves um, sometimes beefing up the normal bacteria, like right here, her escherichia is low, but her enterobacter is high. So we're just looking for trends. So we're going to be maybe advising them to take a really high dose of probiotic. And we're really going to focus on killing this candida and getting the strep down because the strep and actually the enterococcus are, they're too high. And so, um, it's this protocol and it ends up costing people easily around $2,000 for 90 days worth of supplements. And then they're gonna pay another $350 to retest in the end to see what their, what their results are. And, you know, like I said, I, I took clients solid for a year and I found a few things. There were two clients that had phenomenal, phenomenal, like it was life-changing for them. But the rest of them were like, this is really hard. A, take all these supplements, and honestly, I can't afford to keep taking these supplements. And secondly, I don't like, I, I'm not, uh, and then I had one lady who got so anxious about all the food restrictions that it triggered her eating disorder again. Mm -hmm. And so it really caused me to reevaluate and taking everything I learned over that year, I have found that there are legitimate things that you can do with your diet. Is that, it, does that, is that to say that sometimes some supplementation is not, is, is, is a really good idea. Yes. Sometimes, sometimes some supplementation is just what you need, but by far going the nutrition route first. And because the truth is if somebody there's like foundations, if you're not drinking water, if you're not sleeping really great at night, and if you're not pooping a minimum, I mean, I'm like, it's gotta be twice a day. It's gotta be twice a day, period. Like that's your minimum, like not even once a day. I'm talking, it's gotta be a minimum. And if that's not happening, then we don't move forward. We figure that out first, then we move forward, you know, and then we'll talk. And then, and like, I love what you said, where it's like, you know, there was a study done. Um, if you've ever read the biology of belief, Bruce Lipton, he was a neuroscientist. He's an amazing guy. And he studied cells and the biology of belief. And, oh, it's just such, oh, it's such a great book. I I'll stop. I'm just I, have to, I have to write biology of belief. You said yeah, the biology of belief, essentially, essentially what he did is he was, he was like total allopathic, you know, just, just the facts, ma'am, kind of a thing until he was studying cells one day. And I I'm going to butcher this and you're going to read that book and you're going to be like, you got half of it, right, Wendy, but it's kind of <laughs> like this. <laughs> so he was studying cells and he was, he realized as he was studying these cells, that cells have a tendency to move, cells move. They move away from threats and they move towards food. That's how cells work in our body. And so if they, but what they, what they were able to do in their study is they, they were able to somehow create a, uh, an environment where the cell perceived food. It wasn't real food. It perceived it as food. 
and it moved towards it. And they created perceived threats and the cell moved away from it. And so he went on to cite all this really crazy research. And you maybe heard this about people who have degenerative uh, back disease hmm. and complain of like, oh, my back hurts, my back hurts, my back hurts. Somebody did a giant study and x-rayed all these like 1500 backs. And it was like, everybody had degenerative back disease, but only 30% reported pain. Yeah. So it's kind of like we talk about running these labs and do I think there's a place? Yes. Is there, do I think there could be a place for GI mapping for people? Like the two people that had phenomenal results had been three years in and out of doctor's offices. Mm -hmm. They were ready. They were willing. They were committed. They, the, the cost outweighed the better, the benefit outweighed the cost, you know, but I think that um, if we ran labs on all of us, we'd be like, oh, this is a shit show over here. I'm sorry, I should have said that. I'm so sorry. But you know what I'm saying? Like if we ran all of our labs, yeah. Yeah. we would be like, well, just, you know, it's over. It was nice knowing you all. Whereas yeah. instead, I love what you said earlier. Like what instead if we drive our care by the way that we feel? What, yes. okay, what, what do I want to feel more of? What do I want to feel less of? Yeah. So, so this has been really beneficial to kind of confirm what I learned in nutrition school and what you and I talked about, which is that it's not fun and it's not sexy right. to drink and sleep. <laughs> exactly. Which is the other thing I was going to bring up. Like we don't talk about poop enough. Like I can't tell you how many adults I saw when I was doing urgent care before, right? Before I left traditional healthcare who would come in with constipation and they're like, I mean, I haven't pooped for like a week and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, and to be honest, I was one of those people, right? Go back five years or so when I was eating quote unquote, the standard American diet, right? Not drinking enough water, not taking, not sleeping, like all of the things, right? All of the things I struggled with bloating and constipation and get all of that, right? There's so many people struggling with just those baseline, like physiologic functions that if you just start there and say, okay, if we can get you just pooping regularly, mm -hmm. hydrating regularly, right? Good. Sleeping regularly, I would say 90% of our stuff just like falls off the table, right? And then we can say, okay, now let's do like the super deep dive. Do we need this other testing? Do we need to check this lab, right? I mean, because if we treat the symptoms and we get to the point where people are like, wow, I haven't mm -hmm. slept that good. Wow, I have so much more energy. What, why do we need to run a bunch of tests, right? Mm -hmm. that's, but that's my philosophy. And I know you, right? That's kind of, we're, we're like, we're like, the, you know, woo, high five, high five. Because yeah. uh, I think that's, people want to just live a good quality of life, right? And our body, we know like even from a, from a medicine standpoint, we know that if we're, if we're meeting those basic physiologic needs and we're sleeping well, I know that's lowering your cortisol, right? If you're eating predominantly whole food, plant-based, I know that's going to repair your gut. I know that's going to help those tight junctions. I know that's going to help your mood. So I don't need, you know, to like run all the labs ahead of time. I'm doing it based on what we know by research, by science, by reading the evidence, right? Um, we know this stuff. We Not just have to support people. Yeah. I feel like there's a population too, or there could be. I know that I think I fall into this, which is like looking at the labs. I had to, I had to have some blood work. I think it was just like, I think it was just like regular blood work because I hadn't been to the doctor in like 10 years. She's yeah. like, your blood work. And so she did it and it came back. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is like three point, you know, yeah. there's, there's almost, it, it could almost be anxiety producing so unnecessarily, you know? Yep. Because it, because so much of our experience, I mean, I go back to that degenerative disc disease um, uh, study, and it's like, I have a really good friend right now who is six years in her cancer um, journey. They gave yeah. her three months to live. Every wow. three months, they give her three months to live. Months. She goes back in, they're like, you, you, you got six months. She's like, you have to stop telling people this. <laughs> like, like, you really do. <laughs> It's been I'm glad her mental health is so strong because otherwise she would have given up with the, what we were telling, right? Okay, but this is the thing is that she just is like, I've chosen not to, I've chosen not to give thought to it. I've chosen to make my thoughts be surrounded in wellness yes, and, like, and gratitude. And, and, I mean, that's yeah. a whole new thing, like serving other people and doing oh good, my gosh. you know? So, so anyways, but yeah, so I, sometimes I think those labs, you know, they're, they're just not, you know, and don't get me started on uh, <laughs> what 
you call them a uh, uh, food sensitivity test. Oh, are- I, I almost asked, but then I'm like, we don't have time. We don't have time for that. Oh, because there's a, because it can change from hour to hour based exactly. on how long you're doing. Exactly. Exactly. And you just, I mean, just if you think about what Wendy just went through, right? If you have a gut that's not functioning well at baseline, right? So you come to somebody and say, Ooh, I want to run a food sensitivity test. And your gut right now is not functioning well. You don't have that tight fence. You've got this warped, leaky fence. You know you're getting pathogens across that membrane that's going into your bloodstream. So yes, your food sensitivity is going to be positive for things, right? Because we're we're introducing things in a space that it's not supposed to be. So we're testing what we already know Mm. as opposed to just treat it, just Mm -hmm. treat it. Right. And then maybe I would consider doing, but I mean, at baseline, just treat it because we know if you're not eating the right, you know, if you're eating unhealthy, you're not sleeping well, you're, you know, pooping once a week, it's hard and it's, you know, struggle and you don't drink enough water. We already know the state of your gut and we already know you're going to have some sensitivities. Those are your tests. Those are tests right there. How many hours do you sleep? How good? How many times are you pooping? How much water are you drinking? What color is your pee? You know, like. (laughs) <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. I love it. I love it. Well, I, I am so, so happy we did this. And thank you, thank you, thank you for sort of breaking down the gut. How is that connected to sort of mental health, mood disorders? And then love the fact that you gave away the beans and greens, right? Some take home stuff for people to try. And I would challenge people try that yeah. two, three, four weeks, whatever you're willing to do, and just do your own self check, right? Did that make a difference? How do you feel? Well, and I just got to say arugula right now, arugula sauteed in a teeny bit of oil or no oil at all. It doesn't have to be. I mean, that right there, if you haven't tried it, trust me, yeah. it is amazing. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's kind of spicy. I know it's like, sometimes I want like, tell me exactly what to eat, eat some arugula <laughs> and white beans have the highest amount of fiber. I mean, all the beans are good, but I love, yeah. I'm on a white bean kick right now. <laughs> nice. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> Awesome. Any final, I mean, that, that to me, I think was a perfect final word, but you know what I mean? Something super simple, easy to do. Um, so hopefully this was helpful. Um, we will definitely be back because I think Wendy and I have a lot of ground to cover. So I I'm hoping she will come back and we'll talk about some other things together, but thank you so, so much for being here. Um, it was truly a pleasure. Thank you for having me. This was fun. I hope we do it again. For sure. All right. Take care. Take care.